Content warning. This series will discuss topics that may bring up painful experiences for you. Please take the time to surround yourself with good medicines. If need be, pause the playback and go for a walk, stretch, have a glass of water, and come back to the show when you feel comfortable. Welcome to the Métis Speaker Series, presented by TELUS. I'm your host, Darian Kovacs. On this podcast series, we will be exploring learning, healing, and rebuilding within the Métis community. Our goal is to create awareness of and generate discussion about Métis issues, as well as how to heal from and move forward in a healthy way. We hope to reduce Métis invisibility in BC through the personal stories from our Métis community members. This show is brought to you by Métis Nation BC, TELUS, and Jelly Marketing. You gave me everything, a love I've never had. Uh, well, good afternoon. Um, my name is Arlene Vertar Hewitt. Um, my maiden name was Henry. Uh, my ancestral line comes from um, the Batash, uh, Duck Lake, uh, and uh, um, that, that region all in there. And um, um, uh, ancestors from uh, Big Bear Reserve and um, those nations around there. Yeah. Hmm. So this, this was uh, also me as a, <laughs> at the top there. That was me as a, as a younger woman doing the work. So <laughs> I've been doing the work of uh, residential school healing, really, since 1991. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, involved in that. And tell me how that got started. Well, um, uh, I, I, as I said, I was, I was a social worker and uh, um, started to do, uh, in those courses, a lot of uh, self-examination and that kind of thing. And so, um, you know, went back over over family history and that. And um, I had kind of been used to doing that self-examination because of personal history and uh, some history of addictions. I had to I had to take care of that. And um, by the time um, um, this this work opportunity came along and by the time I went into the social work program, um, my first one in in Calgary at Mount Royal College for for my diploma. Um, I was pretty well along the the the, the healing journey, and um, had had done a lot of that that self examination work. So I recognized the value in it, and um, I knew that there were many 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 people in our communities that needed to heal, and um, so. Um, um, I recognized as well in that, that early training that, that I had a, a special skill in, in being able to facilitate that healing. And um, I had a story to share. I had my, my own history to share. And um, I could, I could uh, you know, use those stories to help other people heal. And uh, so I started to do that. And uh, I did that quite a bit, starting then in 1990. And then uh, um, I worked for a period of time as an interim executive director for a national addiction society. And um, <clears throat> we were in charge of, of developing um, training and research materials for NADAP workers across Canada. Mm-hmm. And uh, so <clears throat> one of the publications that we we had developed was a uh, family systems it's called in the spirit of the family and it's all about it's all about uh, healing and 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 grief and and all of that that uh, goes so much along with with um, healing from residential school mm-hmm. s- scars from from um, family trauma, and um, I, I have a, I had a diagram here. I don't know if I brought it along. It was, um, it was a diagram about um, the grieving grieving mm-hmm. cycle mm-hmm. in communities, 
And um, sometimes um, whole communities can be can be grieving yeah. from from the hurts, mm-hmm. um, you know, from 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 the pain, and and uh, there can be all kinds of issues that, that come up in the communities mm-hmm. as a result of that, and uh, um, you know, there can be. Uh, you know, lots of addictions, gambling, uh, family violence, um, sexual abuse, um, and and all of that. And uh, so, those were all areas that I had something to say about and mm. something to something to to share with the communities and and a way in which I thought I would be able to I would be able to frame it. In a in a in a healing way for communities, so coupled with that family systems program, um, and I, I searched out um, uh, the uh, we had been funded by uh, um, uh, Health Canada to do this publication, and it was just one of the publications we did, and so when I approached the um, fellow there at, at uh, Health Canada and asked if I could if I could acquire the rights to reproduce this document. Nice. And so he wrote, wrote me a letter, gave me the rights, and so I was able to reproduce the document and then go about in the communities using this document, helping them to heal. And so I delivered that program many, many times through many, many First Nations communities and many, many places. And it's um, you know I've it, it it can be a week long program it could be like a, a two day program or even I would just go in and do presentations and then I started to do training of the trainers mm. where I would go into communities and I would train communities so yeah. that they could do their healing at first taking yeah. the program then doing a training of the trainer and then they would be able to go and deliver and at a certain level. Um, uh, and in their own communities, and I used to, I used to um, <laughs> kind of laugh and say, you know, I'm working myself out of a job here. <laughs> but um, that's that that's what I wanted to do yeah. because then it would be communities helping to heal themselves, right? And uh, so, you know, in a lot of communities, I did that because I went back time and time again, and uh, um, I I I really think though. So. Um, <clears throat> with the latest uh, developments, I'll say, um, I, I I really think that it's timely that um, the work could start happening again mm. in earnest, you know, um, because I think it's really needed by the communities. And I often hear uh, uh, community members say, you know, that there, there's really nowhere for us to go mm. to, to do this healing. Mm. And... Um, they need to be supported mm-hmm. to do that healing. And uh, this this um, workshop that I do, it can take up to a week, yeah. you know. And so how, how do they do that if they don't get, you know, supported for the time off and supported for, you know, still getting paid for their work and, and that kind of thing to take the training. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm really hoping that it, that it gets going mm-hmm. again because I see it as a real... Um, I, I see it as a really good tool, and and uh, it it's it was it's amazing work. Mm. It really is to see people and and communities heal mm. from from those hurts and those pains. Yeah, you know, yeah. And maybe tell me about your your own personal my story. own my yeah. own my own history. Yeah. Well, this was my dad. Yeah. Uh, he was uh, he was a uh, uh, Métis. Yeah. His name was Adelar Gervais, and this is his, his uh, with uh, Remembrance Day coming up in yeah. November. Yeah. Like, I brought this along because I, I like to remember him and his yeah. service to the country. Yeah. But um, <clears throat> um, my dad, um, my auntie told me that my dad had a really good education. Mm. He had grade eight, don't you know? Yeah. <laughs> and she said, and he was a really smart man. Yeah. And so... Um, my dad um, went and and he fought in the war, mm. and then when, once he returned, he he uh, worked for the Department of Indian Affairs okay. as an Indian agent. Okay, and um, so um, he was Catholic, and uh, he had gone to residential school. We went to a residential day school, mm-hmm. 
And my story is different yeah. in that it's not it's not uh, one of 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 uh, extreme pain and yeah. and hurt because of attending residential mm-hmm. school. Um, as a matter of fact, um, uh, you know I'm I'm grateful for for the message that those missionaries brought us in the early times mm-hmm. of because I I have a firm uh, belief in Jesus Christ mm-hmm. and, and the Holy Spirit and um, and I use that that belief in yeah. Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit to to spread the love and the care and and um, it helps me it helps to ground me it helps me with who I am I still feel uh, loved and you know I I haven't been given a spirit of fear yeah. but a power and love and a sound mind you know and and I believe that I'm given given that by by um, by God mm. and uh, those are my early teachings mm. and. I've never, I've never let go of them, really. Um, I had challenges in my life. Yeah. Otherwise, I probably would not have gotten into trouble with addictions. Yeah. Um, but eventually, you know, those, those, I learned to apply those early teachings so that I could, I could use them to get well. Mm. I didn't know how to apply that before, you know, and um, so. I, uh, I I went into a twelve step recovery program, and then I also I also really really support that for anyone that's mm. struggling and you know those those doors of kindness and love mm. are just always open to anybody and and uh, that uh, message of of life and, and hope was given to um, um, Bill Wilson and and uh, they say Doctor Bob and those two. Um, brought that that program uh, to to people, and they say it's a God inspired program, and uh, it's helped so many people, you know, come out of the out of the mire and start to live healthy yeah. and, and well lives, you know, and and so um, that that program of recovery, I, I applied that program of recovery to my own life, and. Uh, so today I, I really enjoy, I enjoy a sober, mm-hmm. um, uh, spiritually um, uh, connected life. Yeah. And um, I have, uh, you know, a fairly good relationship with my, my children and, and, and my, my uh, grand, granddaughters and mm-hmm. great-grandchildren now, great-granddaughters. <laughs> I have two great-granddaughters and a great-grandson. Who awesome. just develop, uh, uh, developed celebrated his first birthday last oh. week? <laughs> He's Very so cool. cute. Yeah, oh. yeah. So, yeah. So you know, um, I I I feel uh, very sad um, for those people that did not have a good experience in mm-hmm. residential school. I absolutely, I absolutely know that um, that. Uh, you know, uh, everybody's experience wasn't the same, and and for those that are that are are hurting, there's help. You know, there there is help, and uh, I hope uh, programs um, that that are developed to um, help people to heal that they become more easily available, because I think we're still at the stage where it's it's. It's like, uh, oh, we won't talk about that, you know. Um, oh, well, this is going on, and did you know uh, this happened to so-and-so and that kind of thing, and he had a car accident, and he was, you know, he was impaired, and, you know, and he's gone to jail, or she's, this has mm-hmm. happened in her marriage, and this kind of thing. But it, looking at, at the result, but never looking at the why, you know. and. Uh, I, I I really believe those programs of recovery, and if you deal with also the the residential school mm-hmm. healing programs, it's going to get to the crux of the matter. Yeah, it's going to get to the to the root of the matter, and and really really do it. Mm. You know, um, when I when I've done that uh, healing work, yeah. one of the things um, the uh, days of the the program, we do a genealogy. Yeah. And then um, people are, are not only doing the genealogy, but really asked to 
delve deeper and to look at if they knew if there was addictions, Mm -hmm. suicide ideation, sexual abuse, that kind of thing. So it can be very heavy, but it's, it's work that needs to be done, Mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, I think for too long, um, we're not talking about the elephant in the middle of the living room or bumping into him or stepping around him. And sometimes we hit him like a wall, but we won't admit that he's there, you know? And a lot of times that's the elephant in the living room. Mm. And uh, we have to address those issues if we want to heal. Yeah. And so it's the same. It's the same in my family, you know, um, yeah, because um, you know uh, we had residential school issues mm-hmm. um, in our family, and um, because of the different uh, um, life tracks that mm-hmm. that we've gone on, um, you know, uh, our family. Uh, I I did not feel as close to my family as I could because probably a lot of it was out of self preservation too. You know, and that's sad, really. Uh, that um, cutoff, I guess, is is quite common uh, for for a lot of our a lot of our people because we do that to to survive. You know. Did your dad talk much about his experience in the residential uh, actually, school system? Actually, no, he did not, and uh, he died very young too. He died at forty four. Yeah, yeah, heart attack, yeah. and um, that had been his third mm-hmm. one. You know. And um, I have nothing but good memories about mm. about my dad, although I know when he came back from the war mm. that my auntie told me that she said he had that funny head, you yeah. know, and, and and she said, and, and I said, auntie, I think that's PTSD that yeah. you're talking about, post-traumatic stress disorder. Oh, yeah, she said, I think so, because she said he was going around getting in lots of fights and he was drinking and and angry a lot and all of that. And um, something happened to my dad because I think he was able to start to apply those early teachings that he had had uh, to his life. And then he actually went back to the church. uh, Well, he was never away from the church. Um, I have have my my dad's, uh, a picture of my dad's dog tags here. And you can see here on his his dog tags that there's there's a picture of of Jesus there, yeah. and and it's a medal that he wore with wore with his wow. dog tags, right? And so he he uh, you know he, he stayed with the church and and he taught us in that way and and brought me up in that way, you know. So he he didn't didn't talk about his about his residential okay. school experience and. In a negative way, yeah. although my auntie did also say that he was a very smart man. Right. And she said he had a grade eight education. <laughs> and, and to hear her talk yeah. about, well, it, it, Native men, Indian men, Métis men at that time didn't have a lot of higher education. So that was higher education, yeah. I guess. Yeah. And my mom had, I think they said grade four. Yeah. Yeah. So even while you're here today mm-hmm. at this kind of gathering of survivors mm-hmm. and um, kind of descendants of survivors, mm-hmm. those that struggle with religion and faith and, mm-hmm. and you know, the history of what happened, how do you reconcile with your faith and what happened out there in these stories? Well, it's difficult. Um, I, I guess I take it into, and I struggled with that for a long time. I actually... When the first uh, allegations started to come out years and years and years ago, and that's before I had started on my journey of helping with the healing and even my own, I went away from the church. And I I did a, you know, I I started um, uh, belonging to going to other religions and, you know, even tried the new age and that scared the dickens out of me. (laughs) And uh, so, and it kind of got me back um, into, into the church. And um, so I had gone away because of the allegations, yeah. you know, and I couldn't, I couldn't reconcile them. I didn't know how, how, how am I going to, um, you know, go to a church where 
um, there's pedophiles. And so I started to, to look at them as, oh, they're all pedophiles. They're all, that's what they are. And, and that's, not, that's not the case. And um, so, and, and today, um, you know, I, I started to realize and went through a, a, a process of, of healing with, with my church. And, and I started to realize and to look at it in context. And if you think about residential schools in Canada, there were thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of children mm-hmm. in the schools. And if you've ever been a mother of, of th- two kids, then you know how two or three kids all together can become really unruly, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. And I have four at home myself. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Can, can you imagine being in charge of, of you know, sometimes in, in, in a dorm of kids, yeah. maybe, you know, 50, 60 kids in a dorm, right? Yeah. And that's one of the dorms. And then you had maybe three or 400 at the school, right? And so, so and I, I'm not, I'm not uh, excusing um, some of the, the, the wrongs that they did, mm-hmm. um, but I'm taking it into the context of when it happened. Mm-hmm. Um, corporal punishment used to be, I mean, it, white kids were yeah. strapped in the yeah. school. Oh, yeah. you know? I remember being in school that for a period of time, I went to a white school in North Battleford. And uh, there was, she was a friend of mine and she was a, a blonde friend. And, and, uh, but she was tough as nails oh. and she wouldn't take no guff from nobody, yeah. including the teachers. And they didn't like her. And uh, I remember that she did something and she got brought to the front mm-hmm. and that teacher, and he was a male teacher, yeah. he strapped her right in front of everybody. And he brought down that strap on her hands, yeah. like pounding her hands. Yeah. And I remember, you know, that gets me here, yeah. where i watching that, that white teacher pound on another white, white yeah. student and pounding on her hands. And I would, I, if she cried, yeah. it would stop. Yeah. But she would not cry. Mm. She was so tough. And, yeah. and I remember sitting there thinking as a little girl, please cry, please yeah. cry, because I was just little. And she would not cry, and mm. he just he just hammered away at her hands. I, I just you know I ha- still have that memory, mm. and and that was an accepted thing, yeah. like torture of of kids in school. Yeah. So taking it into context now, and you have Aboriginal First Nations Métis kids yeah. in the schools, and there was that prevalent uh, overall attitude yeah. that that kind of Abuse was acceptable to children yeah. at that time. You know? And so <laughs> the, the physical abuses, I take that in, into context. Mm-hmm. So, um, <clears throat> um, and, and then the sexual abuse, um, you know, I, I had that happen in my own family. And, and so, you know, where not myself was affected, but members of my family were. And so, you know, um, I think um, that, that too um, has to be taken into context where you've had all of these thousands and thousands of kids. And, and sometimes these things happen in, in life and not only in Aboriginal First Nations, Indigenous lives, it happens in non-Aboriginal mm-hmm. families as well. And it's still happening. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, it's becoming quite prevalent again with, with all of the uh, stuff you've got going on the internet and, and all of that, right? And kids are sooner than they should be um, being exposed to all of this and, mm-hmm. and they need to be protected from that. But, you know, with the use of internet and all of yeah. that, sometimes they're not. And so I try to take all of that into context and yet... That other part of my brain says, yes, but they were entrusted with those young lives, yep. you know, and, and those, those were supposed to be priests that you could trust. Mm-hmm. And so what happened, what happened with them, you know, 
And that one is, is a tough one to reconcile in, in my mind. So the only way I can reconcile it is I'm glad that the allegations are happening. I'm glad that more and more the church is being exposed because I do believe in good and evil. And I believe that evil is working really hard to destroy good on this earth. And I believe that the church is good. It carries a message, a very important spiritual message. And I believe that evil wants to see the destruction of that that church that continues to carry that message. And so a lot of those weak um, ones, the priests, the ones that are too weak to resist that, would succumb to that and then be the, the perpetrators of those abuses, and then hence making the church look very bad. Um, I, I, that, that is how I reconcile it. I, and, and I am also quite happy that this is happening in the church. And I think more and more and more, if there's any more pedophiles, any more perpetrators in the church, I hope they are discovered. I hope they are, they are thrown out. And once again, you're going to have purity that, that, that should have been there in the first place. And so that's, that's kind of how, how I reconcile it and come to a, a place where I can continue to go, in which I do. I still I t- I attend Mass. I go to church. And a lot of our Métis people do. You know, um, we have a lot to be grateful to the church for because our Catholic church kept stringent records about our baptisms. Mm-hmm. You know, I have, I have history here of, you have like my, my great, great, great grandfather, Jean-Baptiste, born a uh, European race, Roman Catholic, married Madeleine Bonneau, and then Madeleine Métis, a Roman Catholic daughter of Jean-Baptiste, mm-hmm. um, and here died, and then here uh, Alexis Gervais, 1822, Red River Settlement, Roman Catholic, <laughs> and then married Madeleine Fallant, and and uh, and it goes on wow. right down to 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 my my uh, history. A long line of of Catholics, and so the Church kept stringent records, and that is often how Métis people are able to trace our lineage and our connection to Métis, you know. And we have to be grateful for that, you know, because uh, if that wasn't there, we wouldn't be able to trace that ancestry. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they, uh, the births, the baptismal records, the marriages, yeah. and all of that. And my my uh, mom and dad were actually married in that uh, church in Batash. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I was just recently at Batash this yeah, summer. Yeah, and uh, I think two, my two older siblings were baptized in that church. Oh. It's a museum now. Yeah, so of course, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You can see the bullet holes in the yeah. front of it. And, <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, a Beautiful I, stained glass window. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. That, that's a veteran's pin. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and this one here is for the uh, Métis Centennial Gathering that was in, in Batash. Okay. Yeah, and that was really cool to be at, the 40,000. Métis all there. You could just see all these canvas tents yeah. and RVs, and it was just wonderful. Yeah. And then this here is uh, showing that I'm, I'm a Métis elder for our our local uh, um, early years center there in yeah. Kelowna. It's called Mama Wapun. And, uh, yeah, so just some little special pins on there. It's beautiful. Uh-huh. It's beautiful. Uh-huh. Yeah. Now tell me about the, the, when the news articles came out. They would always um, put a disclaimer. You know, this is a triggering article or this is a, a triggering story, and they would offer the the one eight hundred number, mm-hmm. the, the hotline. Tell me about the hotline and what that offers. Uh, well, um, I've not called it, but um, I think uh, that that hotline uh, anyone can call that hotline at any time. I believe it's mm-hmm. uh, 24, 24 hours and. Yeah. And that was that was a long time ago that that one eight six six number came out, 
And uh, I would suppose by now they've probably gotten many, many, many calls. Mm -hmm. And that's so good that it's there. Um, I know one of the speakers today was at the conference was talking about another uh, 1-800 number. I don't know okay. if it's the same one. Okay. Um, it might be. It might be different. Okay. Yeah. So it's good that those are there yeah. uh, for for those folks that are really hurting and 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 have no one to immediately talk to um, because. You know, uh, if a person doesn't have someone that they can they can share that with, uh, that they feel safe in being yeah. able to share that, yeah. then they're carrying that load alone, and and it's a scary place to be. Yeah. Have you had a magic wand so out there? What's called the magic wand experiment or a blue sky thought here? What would be one wish you could have for residential school students? What would what? The one wish, one hope that you have. If you could, if you could just make something happen, your dream or your hope, or reality. What would you like to see happen? Hmm. Golly, uh, oh well, just like like seventy five percent of the population, I'd be rich. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that seventy five percent of the population would say that. Yeah, <laughs> but rich doesn't mean yeah. really rich. Yeah, right. It's. Uh, I mean, I could be rich and yeah. very unhappy, and yeah. if I was dealing with issues of, of addictions, if yeah. I was dealing with with issues of sexual yeah. abuse, if I was still dealing with issues of residential yeah. school, all the money in the world, isn't going to help me to yeah. heal. It's it's what I talked about. Yeah. It's 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 about getting to the crux of the matter. Yeah. And and getting to the crux of the matter. Um, as I was talking to you before about this, this, this work that I did, mm -hmm. um, a part of the work that I do is uh, also was with a program called the right to be special. Mm. And that's a, a sexual abuse disclosure mm. training workshop. And so this, that, that work, um, was developed for these NADAP workers because one of the things that they told us, um, as, um, an agency that was responsible for developing their training materials was that 80% of the people that came to them for addictions help, 80% mm. of them had been affected by sexual abuse. Mm. That's, that's huge. Wow. And so they found that sometimes they were affected. If they couldn't, if they couldn't deal with it, yeah. You, you don't feel comfortable in talking with the, about that. So what do you do? You shut down. You shut down the disclosure. Yeah. Um, sometimes that disclosure um, will be the only time. That might be the first time a person's gotten enough courage yep. to to come forward and say, "This is what happened to me." And if they don't have that support to carry on mm -hmm. with that healing. It gets buried again, yeah, and then you know that those 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 hurts that that are buried. If you don't do something about that pain, yeah, it'll kill you. Yeah, and it can actually literally kill you through um, suicide. Yeah, uh, you might drink yourself to death. You might drug yourself to death. Yeah, you might violence yourself to death. Yeah. you know, family violence is what it can do, and so. Um, that 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 healing work is is so important. So, um, going back to your original question yeah. about you know what what I would wish for, yeah. I think I would wish that we would we would have the courage um, and have the place to go to to do our healing work. Yeah. That. And you're not going to get platitudes and you're not going to, um, you know, be told, well, here, beads and moccasins. <laughs> it's important yeah. that, that, that beading is important, yeah. uh, that, that, that weaving and all of that. But it's not going to get to the crux of the matter. Yeah. You're not going to talk about what it is that's really hurting you, you know. And so that would be my wish. Would that there would be a place that a person could go when they were ready 
to go and do their healing. You know, there are all kinds of, of, of uh, treatment centers yes. yeah. for addictions. Yes. People can go yeah. into the treatment centers and work on their addiction to alcohol, their addiction to drugs, mm -hmm. and it's all about that. And yeah. it can be a month of that. Yeah. What if we had those kind of treatment centers for residential school mm -hmm. healing? Mm -hmm. And how they got, much they got paid to be there. And yeah. they, they got their oh, wages oh, oh, covered. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. And, and how much healing would take place? Yeah. You know, we would that, that do so much for those people that were on the streets. Yeah. For those people that are in broken families. Mm. There would be so much that would be done. But specifically about the residential school healing for our people. Yeah. Yeah. So that would be something I would really like to see. Yeah. Is there anything else you'd want to share with listeners and viewers? Uh, I think this is just wonderful that they have this opportunity for the community to come together. And uh, um, they're going to be asking us here, I think, about do you want MNBC to, to do for, for those people, the residential school survivors? And uh, I will be vocal. Yeah. <laughs> about that and and one of the things would be that you know um there needs to be special places mm -hmm. where people can go and do their their healing work mm -hmm. and i think that there are um a couple that have 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 started that um uh i i think there might be now but um this in first nations communities mm -hmm. and so i'd really like to see that happening in our metis communities yeah. specifically for metis yeah great hope mm -hmm. great yeah. dream and so you know just gratitude for for this happening yeah. gratitude for you folks for being here and uh when will I be able to see the podcast yeah and... you you, you know, give, it, give it about a month or next year you'll be in the next season and uh-huh yeah no i really it, it, so where where would it be? it'll it'll be on the everywhere you can find podcasts it'll yeah. be on uh, youtube as well it'll be yeah. on the website and and what was the name of it podcast uh, metis speaker series metis speaker series yeah okay yeah and in about a month you yeah. say yeah oh yeah you'll get your portrait done by nevada uh-huh she's gonna paint you up all beautifully and oh, okay yeah okay well no thank you for really sharing nice your story you. yeah, yeah i really appreciate yeah. it This has been the Métis Speaker Series podcast presented by TELUS, and I'm Darian Kovacs. Thanks to Métis Nation BC and TELUS for making this possible, with funding provided by the Civil Forfeiture Office's Indigenous Healing Stream. You can listen to all of our episodes, learn more about the podcast, and sign up to the Métis Nation of BC newsletter to stay up to date on Métis news at metispodcastseries.ca. You can find out more about the music we're playing by Love Life by visiting SoundCloud at soundcloud.com slash lovelifeofficial, L-U-V-L-Y-F official, and link in the show notes for your convenience. Follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast listening device. See you again soon. Mina Kawapa Mitten. Thank you, Marcy, for listening. Mm -hmm.